Good morning and welcome to the Momentum Matters podcast. My guest this morning is Ashley Gann, friend and chief meteorologist at Channel 42 here in Birmingham. So Ashley has, her career has spanned three states and um, from three different cities, Birmingham, Atlanta, Montgomery. Ashley has covered some of the most significant weather events in our recent times, including the tornadoes of April 27th. That was 20, what year were we? 20 what? Um, was that, oh, April 27, 2011. 2011, That's, I was about to say 2014, but that just seemed a little too recent, yeah. So um, after receiving her degree in aerospace engineering from Auburn, Ashley went on to Mississippi State and earned her master's degree in meteorology. And then she became the 795th certified chief broadcast meteorologist in the nation. And she was the first female chief meteorologist in the state of Alabama. And you were probably only one of a handful nation, nationwide, is that correct? Uh, that's right. Only 8% of all chief meteorologists, even today, 8% are females. Yeah like about 8% of cheap anything. Yeah, that's right. Single <laughs> digits. Yeah. So while you may know Ashley from her many TV duties, she and her husband also co-own the 101 Mobility Company. And Ashley, we'll get into that a little bit yeah. um, later in the podcast. I'd like to hear more about your entrepreneurial side. And they will soon be expanding their business into the Auburn area. They're going to be opening an Iron Tribe. Yeah. Coming to the Plains. So fun. So fun. So welcome, Ashley. I cannot Thank wait you. to hear more about your story. Of course, you and I have known each other for a while now. I think we first met when we shared um, the stage at the Sloss Tech. That's the right. Sloss Tech um, event. Um, and it was so great to meet you there and, and to have kept up our friendship. And uh, I hated that, that COVID kind of kept us from meeting yeah. for such a long time. But um, hey, here we are. Here we are. That's here right. So um, I'd like to get started. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is help people understand sort of how you got to where you are. Um, and so I was hoping you would share a little bit about your upbringing and your family life with us, um, just, just to get us oriented. Yeah, so short story, I was born and raised in Fort Worth, Texas before moving to Atlanta, Georgia in middle school. My dad's job at the time transferred us from Texas to the Peach State. And funny story is that you know, there's a saying, you can take the girl out of Texas, but you can't take Texas out of the girl. And so I kind of went to Georgia kicking and screaming just a bit. Plus, it was a hard transition. It was middle school. Eh. Uh, but one of the things that I always wanted to do was attend space camp. Now, for those that may not know, space camp is only held in Huntsville. So although there are different space centers across the United States, it's unique that Huntsville is the only uh, place that has space camp. Now, mind you, growing up in Texas, Huntsville seemed like, no pun intended, moons away from where we were. So that wasn't necessarily something on our radar. But when we moved to Georgia, it was definitely a little bit closer. And I begged and pleaded with my mom, hey, since you took me out of Texas, could you at least let me go to space camp? And the reason this is a pivotal part of the story is while I was at space camp is when I decided I wanted to be a meteorologist. And you might think, well, how did those two correlate? Well, we took some classes while I was there. I had an elective. It was uh, meteorology. There was a space meteorology elective. It's really cool. And I realized I had just a fascination and, uh, and, and deep kind of, uh, I wanted to know more about atmospheric science, whether it was our atmosphere or whether it was space. And so at the very end of space camp, I told my mom that, hey, I've definitely solidified that I have a love for science specifically, and uh, I, I have this little problem. I talk too much, so I would get demerits. No, no. <laughs> so I would, uh, I would always get great grades in school. It was just my conduct would be, you know, needs improvement, talks too much in class, right? Thank you. Be. B know. minus minus in conduct. <laughs> Okay. So, you know, I was never the star student when it came to, you know, my contact because I talked too much. So I said, mom, I can blend the love for science that I have along with this kind of unfortunately demerit that I would get in class. And I can get paid to talk about what I love. Like in my little 11, 12 year old mind, it seemed like the perfect marriage of my skill sets and, and passions, right? 
Well, you know, as any mom does, pat you on the head and, and send you along and says, you know, probably going to change your mind 10 times before you actually do your real job. Well, here I am, right? I've been in uh, broadcast television for almost two decades, which is crazy. So along that path, uh, we were in Atlanta. The Weather Channel is based out of Atlanta. I had a couple opportunities to go in and, and shadow some meteorologists along the way. I went to Auburn for my undergrad where I did major in aerospace engineering and actually my senior uh, design project was around a space mission design, and one of the professors was a former astronaut. So I've, I've always had just a love for space and um, a passion, really. And, and what I realized in college is that my, my passion, not only academically for the subject, um, was there, but I also began to realize how underrepresented women were in this space, not this space, but uh, colloquially <laughs> are uh, the space of, you know, STEM or leadership. Uh, there were times when I was at Auburn, I'd be in a math class. I was the only female. And this was the early 2000s. Like th this was, this is somewhat modern day. Like this, this wasn't necessarily 30, 40 years ago uh, when say my mom was at Auburn and it was totally different dynamics there. So, I mean, this was fairly modern day. And uh, like I said, I'd be the only female. It, it never made me feel necessarily ostracize or anything for being the only one, but I also realized like there's definitely a component to, um, to, to kind of this narrative of, of getting more underrepresented people groups in some of these majors. And then, so I went on, so put a pin in that. I went on to grad school at Mississippi State. That's where I did meteorology for my master's. And beyond that, I started on TV and I always said, hey, if the whole weather thing doesn't work out, I guess I can always fall back on being a rocket scientist. So not a bad gig. <laughs> I never had to pull that card, but I mean, we can kind of talk a little bit later in the podcast about my pivot. But, um, but I will be pivoting out of broadcast TV, but still using a lot of my skill sets um, in the next chapter is I will actually be working at Auburn University in a new capacity here starting in um, about a month from now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that. Yeah. Uh, before we get there, I was wondering, so like going into aerospace engineering and um, especially at that time, obviously, like you said, not something that a lot of girls do. Mm -hmm. um, when you express that interest in space and in going to space camp, were there people that were um, involved along the way, um, could be your parents, but could be outside your parents too, that, that really encouraged you and said, no, girl, you want to do this, you just go do it. Well, to be honest, the short answer is no. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of cheerleaders. Uh, my biggest support, and I would say my role model, was my mother, and not being cliche, but uh, there was a time my mom was a single parent. She was climbing the corporate ranks in the 80s and early 90s, and she made a name for herself, became very successful, became a CIO of a major company, and she now works for startups in Atlanta. And so she's always someone that I've witnessed breaking those glass ceilings, and I always feel like she did it so effortlessly, effortlessly and in her three-inch heels. And when she was getting on her plane flights on Monday mornings and all the guys are schlepping around there briefcase and everything else. My mom was dressed to the nines doing it in high heels, you know, uh, and, and all of her jewelry and all of that. All that to say, um, my mom, I think, really modeled that for me. She modeled what it was like to take risk. She modeled what it was like to follow my heart. And no was never an answer. And she never questioned any of my aspirations. And not to say that I haven't had people that have helped me. I've had some tremendous uh, kind of internally mentors specific to meteorology along the way. I've had some, some wonderful colleagues along the way that have become friends and family. But what's so interesting, when I was younger, when I was in my middle school and high school years, and even in college, I can't necessarily pinpoint an individual because there just weren't a lot of people like me. There weren't a lot of people that even had the same goals because one of the things that I find a little bit more interesting too, not to say that people, male or female, don't necessarily aspire to have families and all of that, but I think women in particular, they want to have a mentor that not only can accomplish in the professional world uh, what the highest success they can, but they also want to accomplish that in their home life as well. And I think mentorship is kind of blending those worlds. So women are looking for uniqueness in that. And so 
I've had some fabulous male mentors, but they may not have all of the components that maybe I was looking for, but professionally, uh, they're great mentors, but maybe home management was a little different. So, um, so I will say again, more of a cliche answer. My mom definitely was my role model. And she's also been someone I leaned on and leaned into in almost every career decision that I've made along the way. And she's been a very supportive voice of wisdom and given some advice. And the great thing now at this season in my life is she and I can now dialogue about career versus before it was just simply me seeking advice. Like, what do I do? You know, now we can have this fun and engaging dialogue about, hey, what can we build? What can we do next? And it's, um, it's almost like the best of you know, the mom and professional mentor all in one and always a phone call away. And at 11 o'clock at night, you know, with those <laughs> mentors, you know, they're like, okay, my phone's on silent after eight o'clock, Ashley. So yeah. We're both incredibly blessed in that way. I call my mother is the chief mom officer at Momentum. Yes. <laughs> she's, yes. she's available, not just to me, but to my whole team and, you know, just the, the, um, the advisor, the confidant, and quite frankly, the therapist most of the mm -hmm. time. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It's fantastic. Yep. So blessed. Um, so, so did you just go to space camp one year? I did. Yep. And that's all it took. That's all it took. That's all it took. And your experience at Auburn getting your um, aerospace engineering degree at that time and being one of so few probably women in the program, um, you know, sometimes I can play out one of two ways and you might've had it both ways, but sometimes it's like you get extra attention because you are the only woman in the room. And sometimes you get extra barriers thrown in your way because um, consciously or not, they're a little bit trying to weed you out. Right. Did you have those experiences? So here's what's really interesting. And I, I kind of want to share this as a credit to Auburn University. So when I started they bring in the freshman engineers and essentially they're, they say two thirds of you in this room are not going to make it. So it's this big talk and all the guys and gals are all in the same room. Well, when you think about two thirds, you're sitting there, you've got somebody to your right, somebody to your left. That means two of you ain't making it through the program, yeah. right? And you're hoping it, it's not you. You're like, well, this guy's not going to make it. And this girl's not going to make it like, uh oh. Or is it me and this person, you know? So that was kind of the mindset I would say about 20 years ago is this whole weeding out process. Fast forward to today, Auburn does something very unique. And one of the metrics that they use to be a very competitive engineering program nationwide is their equity. You know, how, um, how are they sharing, how, how many men and women, you know, they, they do an assessment. And what they found is that they actually now will separate out the freshman class. So in orientation, once you declare a major, you know, the engineers that have declared, they will separate out the females and the males and the parents. Okay, so the parents of girls and boys and guys. And so they will say, hey, we're going to have a talk with y'all because here's why. What we find is girls perform the same, if not better than some of the guys in the class. But most of the girls that go into engineering were probably top tier at the high school they came from. They probably didn't struggle too much through high school. They probably have very high GPAs. They were probably very involved, uh, you know, essentially star students where they came from. But now they're in a program that's a little bit more rigorous and they may show up with a C their first semester. Well, a girl that's all she knows is getting A's and then gets a C, it is a huge shock to the system. So girls see that letter C as I'm not cut out for this. I'm not good enough where a guy may see it and say C for complete. So it's a <laughs> total mindset. And so what Auburn University's engineering program has recognized is that we actually have to separate out these groups and we have to encourage the parents when girls make that phone call first semester, hey, I want to come home. I want to change my major. It's no, we're going to do this together because what we have to remind the, the young ladies is the guys are doing just the same thing. And just because they're cheering in their desk doesn't mean they got an A. They got the same grade as you. It's just their response to that grade is different. So we have to also understand, too, in this gender conversation, that the way that women and men process information is different. Like there is a uh, physiological difference in how we set ourselves apart, how we compare ourselves. And women tend to compare ourselves and judge ourselves personally much more harshly than our male counterparts may. 
So kudos to Auburn for that. I think they have found some tremendous success. They've created some mentor mentee programs. They have an organization called 100 Women Strong, where they actually have uh, professional mentors that are mentoring the, the college students. So that exists today. It did not exist when I was in school. So kind of circling back to that question, I will say uh, good, bad, and different. I never felt different. And I will say these conversations about, um, I guess, creating more access for underrepresented groups, those conversations were just not as topical 20 years ago. But in a way, in a strange juxtaposition, because it wasn't the topic du jour, I don't think I even recognized some days that I was different. Like I knew that I was a female in a class full of males, but in no way did that take away from what I was learning. It didn't take away from my access to my professors. I don't think that there were any barriers, honestly. Um, and I think the only thing looking back is that I probably would have been more proactive in a certain, in a few certain areas, because as a female, I did beat myself up probably a little bit more over bad grades or things like that, but it's engineering. It's all hard, right? But through that, I will say one of the really great things, when things get hard, we find relationships. And that's one of the greatest things that I built at Auburn. I have some of the deepest friendships with those people that I was in class with. And even though we all went on and some went to grad school, some started, you know, went to professional, professional route and all of that, um, we've even to this day stayed very close, but it's almost because we were just in the throes of, of the hardest days of our lives in engineering school together, studying at all hours of the morning, noon, and night together. So it, it created a camaraderie. And what's neat is that was what kind of bound us all together, even though we were different and we had different backgrounds. It was that kind of like, oh, this is really hard, but we're here together, you know, that kind of created um, that, that sense of community for us. But as far as that goes, I will say, I don't, I don't necessarily remember any specific barriers, but as I've seen things evolve, I've thought to myself, wow, I wish I could have had that access. So, you know, so it's a weird juxtaposition. I don't think anything really held me back, but I also think where could I be or what other things could I have been exposed to had I had some other opportunities? Sure, sure. And you're going to have an opportunity to, um, I'm sure, to, to lock back in in all yeah. of as a yes. mentor and in your new role. So um, I would love to hear a little bit more um, about that in just a second, because I have one more question about you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So as a chief meteorologist, um, and you know, you and I have talked a little bit about this before, but like, you know, you're an attractive woman, you're young, you're a chief meteorologist. How have you handled this um, stigma that I'm sure you have encountered more times than once? that you're not the weather girl? Oh, uh, so I often say if someone says, uh, you know, they'll bump into you and I know, bless their hearts. They mean it colloquially. Oh, you're, you're a weather girl. I'm almost like, at least just call me a weather lady. Not only are you trivializing me professionally, <laughs> but woman. also, yeah, there you go. But even in age, like you're kind of belittling my youth here. Uh, now I, I will often answer that with a bit of a joke and I'm like, oh, weather girl, well, I've been called worse, you know? And, and it's, it is a conversation starter for sure. Um, but you don't hear men being referred to as, oh, you're a weather boy, you know, but it's Never. always the weather girl, right? Um, Neither did they have to be good looking to get on the air. Right. Well, and that's, oh, that's like a whole nother conversation. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of that whole joke I say with my mom, you know, she was doing the same corporate flight routes as these men were, but she was doing it in high heels and, you know, looking the part and, and do makeup done and all of that. But, um, but I always say that too about, and, and, and you know this, I, I speak a lot about gender equity in the workplace and there is a difference between equality and equity and equality is giving everybody the same tools to achieve a goal when equity is giving people different tools to achieve a greater outcome. But in order to do that, you have to really be able to assess who those people are and what their needs are so that you can get them, everybody elevated to the same, um, to the same level of success. Because what we've realized is giving everybody the same exact tools doesn't always help everybody. For example, time is something that I need more so than my male counterparts because I have to do my hair and my makeup. 
before every newscast. And that's more time than my male counterparts need. That doesn't mean because I'm a woman, I'm less capable of doing my job. It just means that there's an, an added requirement because I'm a female to do this. Um, but I also think that in being a female and doing this particular job, I have to work extra hard at gaining credibility you have to gain trust with viewers and you do. And, and it's kind of this subconscious bias. And I know a lot of people may not say that they admit, admit that they think this, but there is a subconscious bias because traditionally we've watched men deliver the weather. That's who we've entrusted uh, our families to whenever there's uh, tornado sirens going off. Um, so what's been really I think a joy for me, and it's been work, is I've been in the weather enterprise in the state of Alabama since 2007. And it's been wonderful to watch and build trust with communities and see how, uh, how people are changing their mindset. And they, they're willing to kind of open up and say, oh, yeah. And, and I have, I, I really have gained some of the best viewers and I have some of the most loyal viewers and I'm, I'm super thankful for that, but it's a lot of work. Um, but I think it, it goes, that is a, that's kind of a blanket statement across leadership in general, executive teams. I think it always takes women an extra step to be able to gain that trust of employees, of your managers. Uh, when you're giving out information, why do I trust what she's saying over what he's saying? Again, it's that subconscious bias that sometimes works against us. But, um, but the way that I've kind of overcome that is through education. So one of the things that I love to do is outreach. I do public speaking and I do weather visits. So it's establishing that I have value outside of giving the forecast on television every day. And when I've established that I have something valuable to offer your team, your school, your community, that's a lot easier to gravitate towards. And then it's easier to watch on television because you go, oh, I met her. I know her. Oh, she has this value to add to my organization or she spoke to my kid's school and taught about severe weather. So that value piece, I think, is very critical in establishing credibility and trust anywhere that we go. And that's the one way that I've helped to overcome a little bit of the weather girl stereotype is by adding value back into my community beyond the airwaves. Well, and I can attest to that because you spoke on the topic of equity at the Momentum mm -hmm. Conference at one yes. of our breakout sessions. That's right. Super well received. Yes. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, so tell us more about this decision that you have made, um, this entrepreneurial pivot. Um, yeah. I think that, that is one of the things that uh, is difficult for anyone to do. It's especially difficult when you are a significant portion of the family income. And um, we have not mentioned yet on this podcast, you have four children under nine, four, yes. four children <laughs> under nine, um, a very involved and very supportive and loving husband. It's a lot. You have done a lot. And for you to take that and everything that you have put into your career so far and make this pivot, tell us about that. Yeah. So backing up to the entrepreneurial piece, something that I don't advertise a lot on air or even on my social media, my husband and I are business owners. He pretty much runs the day in and day out operations of our businesses. I always say I get the fun part. I get to vision cast and I'm the one that gets to look at businesses and I, I do assessments and I'll say, Hey, let's look at this. Let's look at that one. So I'm, I'm in the back office piece of our, of our business, but we still discuss business every day. And, um, but like I said, he kind of runs that and, and a little history on him. He's been in the franchising space since his mid twenties and, um, he's done restaurant and he's, we now own a local business. Like you mentioned, 101 mobility here locally, but we actually have expanded across the entire state of Alabama. And uh, we'll be opening up a functional fitness gym called Iron Tribe in Auburn here very soon. So this opportunity came about. We were just members of the gym. And lo and behold, they, you know, kind of pitched out an email and said, hey, we're looking at expanding. And one of the things that we do is uh, we look over franchise models and we'll say, hey, is this model a good fit for our family? And one, one of the things that's really important for us when we decide about business is, is this something that we can incorporate our children in? Is this something they would, could and would work at? Is this somewhere we would feel comfortable with our daughters working at? 
And is this something that it could be a legacy building business, whether it be for family members, for our own children, something that we could either pass down or end up selling one day. So there are some parameters that we specifically look for. And for those reasons, there's things, uh, there's specific business models that we don't look at because they don't match some of that criteria. So Iron Tribe did. So fast forward, we're, we're looking into this uh, the Iron Tribe opportunity and um, the owner was asking us, you know, what locations would you be interested in? Of course, Auburn came on the table. Now, an aside, you know, I'm an Auburn grad, but I just love Auburn. Okay. I have a Georgia Bulldog husband and, but he has come to games with me for a long time. All right. And he wears his orange and blue. He doesn't necessarily have a shirt that says Auburn. I think that might change once we move down there, but even his Georgia friends just razz him all the time. They're like, do you even like Georgia anymore? But, uh, <laughs> but all that being said, we used to always drive back from games back to Birmingham and I would say, if we lived in Auburn, we'd be home by now, you know, totally <laughs> joking. And so now look at us. So this opportunity came up. There's a lot of great things about Auburn, about why business there is good, why starting a business there is good, why starting this particular business there is good. And so that was, that was the impetus for everything. Now, in the beginning, we're like, well, do we need to move down there? Or is this something we can manage from afar? Because remember, I do have a very public job. I'm in weather. And that's not necessarily an easy decision. And it's the only career I've known. And, um, and in this gig economy, it's kind of rare that someone stays with the same profession for 17 years. Um, so that it was a big shift if that was to happen. So we really prayed about it. And a really unique opportunity came about at the university. So I've accepted the position of public information officer, and I'll be working in their safety and security department. And as I tell people, I get to take the very best of what I'm doing now, and I get to roll that into this new role. And it's actually an inaugural position as well. So outreach, service, leadership, yes, even severe weather and some forecasting, content creation, I'll get to take all of those pieces and roll them into this new role. And I'll get to do it for a very specific community of people there uh, on the universe at the university and in Lee County. So that's really neat. But I'll get to maintain a lot of my um, public private partnerships, I'll still get to do outreach within the community, I'll still get to do public speaking. So it's just really neat how the skill sets that I have. And, and a lot of that, and, and we can kind of unpack this a little bit more, but very high level. I was at a point where I thought in my mind, I, I thought I was quitting something. And I think we often get there, even as women, we're like the ultimate loyalist. And you're like, oh no, if I leave, I'm quitting. And then I was like, well, I don't want to be a quitter. And then I was like, no, 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 no. You're transferring your skills. You're pivoting. Like everything you've learned and you've built here can be applied and you can help something else grow. And that's when we did have a business mentor. This, this one phrase came up, Derek and I are builders. So when it comes to businesses, there are some people that are in it for the longevity. Derek and I know that our, our skill set is taking something fresh and new and building it from good to great. And that's our favorite part is the building piece. We love to put those pieces of the puzzle together. And that through that, we learned that we all have some unique skill sets that we always bring to the table, whether it's an employee, an employer, a business owner, a manager, and identifying where those skill sets and what those skill sets are and how they can serve your role and the people that you're serving the best is, is really what's most critical. It's not that am I able to follow this job description to a T, but it's, am I understanding what, what I can bring that's a value and really living in that most valuable space. So what we've realized is we're most valuable when we're building something. And then we can take what we've built and give it on to somebody else and build something new. It's a lot of energy and it's time consuming. And there's some people who are like, we don't like to build. Like we want it once it's built, you know, and that's okay. Um, but that's what our appetite is. So I think that's what's really exciting about this new chapter is we both are, I, I feel like right where we're supposed to be. We're building something new. Um, it has, and then in, in my new role, I'll get to build out in this inaugural position, something for university and people that I love so much. I love Auburn. <laughs> well, it sounds like the ideal role for you, Ashley. I mean, just thinking about all of those talents that you have, the, the um, image that you have 
crafted on social media and in public spaces and the public speaking you've been doing and uh, your ability to relate to others and to communicate and um, and to manage just a, sort of a vast uh, enterprise really um, is going to be fabulous. So I'm very really excited. excited for you. And, and you know, I, I um, there's going to be an announcement coming out soon, but my I told folks that I'm, I'm excited about being home for dinner and saying that it doesn't take away anything that I'm doing right now. I've always worked very non-traditional hours. Um, I, I, I said, I, I think TV people go through some sort of like t TV PTSD when it's like a normal day, like a nine to five or an eight to five job. We're like, wait, what are we doing? I'm not waking up in the middle of the night. I'm not going to sleep in the middle of the night. Like, wait, what's going on here? Um, but it'll, it'll be nice to have that. And I think in a season, when my kids need it most and need that consistency and routine. I even was telling my boss when, when we were having these hard conversations, I said, I, I just wish in TV, we could just take sabbaticals. Uh, you know, pastors take sabbaticals. There's other professions. They just take sabbaticals because there is a grind to this t the, the TV business in general. Um, I'll never complain about it, but um, but the reality is there's just things that I have to make choices about, whether I miss ball games here or miss a dance recital here, you know, and you kind of mentioned it before. My husband is a tremendous helpmate and not everybody's cut out to be a TV personality spouse. I will say it takes a very special uh, person to come alongside and, and help out. And so with the flexibility of his job here, he's been able to manage so much of that at home to our kids haven't had to miss out on a ton, you know, cause that, that's what always made me sad is, oh, well, what if we can't get to all the places at the same time and you're the only one that can drive them all around. So, uh, so it will be all that to be said. I think it will be nice to have some, some more routine and to be able to share meals around a dinner table. It sounds simple, but looking forward to those simple things. It sounds simple, but it's such a treasure. You know, it's it such is. a valuable time. And right. your children being the ages that they are now, it's it's the ones that they'll remember. Yeah. Right. That's There's right. so much that happens before the age of eight. Uh, it's incredibly important. We know that from psychologists, but in fact, our children don't actually remember it. Yeah. You Isn't know? that wild? Yep. Yeah, it's crazy for me to think back to all the sacrifices that I made when they were little. And I talk about them now and they're like, yeah, I have no recollection of that whatsoever. <laughs> right. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, so um, as a as parting words of wisdom, I would uh, love if you would give us and our audience some advice. If there are listeners out there that are thinking about making a big change, a big life change, what are some of the things that you think are um, helpful in getting over some of the fear factor that goes with that? Yeah, I would say be careful to give the voices in your head too much of your microphone. And what I mean by that is sometimes these voices of doubt, the it's not time, you're not good enough, are you sure you don't want to stay? Don't let that reside in a larger space than it needs to. Now, I will say our bodies, our central nervous system is designed to be risk adverse, right? Our central nervous system doesn't want us to take risk. It doesn't want to um, initiate those adrenal glands. But there is something to be said for being willing to take your next step in faith. And I think that's a big part of our story is that we collectively, my husband and I decided that this was a really great move forward for our family. And what we also assessed is the long-term, looking at it from a long-term lens and not a short-term lens. I heard a great piece of advice the other day, and it was somebody who is in the business, who has gotten out the television business, and they're about 10 to 15 years ahead of me in, in their season of life. But they said, uh, it's not what you're giving up, it's what you're gaining. And I would always just encourage people, don't look back on your career and think, oh, I'm, I'm leaving this or I'm giving up all of this, but think, what am I gaining? And sometimes what you're gaining isn't always tangible. It may not be a dollar amount. It may be time. It may be relationships. It may be just your own mental health. So I would also say, don't always use um, objective indicators as the only measurement 
before leaving one to go to another, whether that's salary or whatever, do you've got to do what's right for you. And I also want to give permission to all of your listeners to, to think bigger than what you think you're capable of. Because I think when we do certain roles for as long as we do, we often stereotype ourselves and we typecast ourselves. So we think we're only good enough for something and we think, how can anybody else see value in me? So I would also encourage people to look at all of the things you've done and and realize each one of those things is added value and how you put that all together is your narrative. So skill sets can be similar person to person, but how you how you put that bow on that package and you frame those skill sets, that's what matters. You know, because a communication skill set, a lot of people can talk, but are you a storyteller or are you a presenter? Are you, you know, so there's different types of communicators. So looking at that. So I would say for anybody that's considering to make a move and to, to make that pivot, I want to encourage you to, to be okay stepping away, even if you're stepping away from something that's very comfortable to maybe something that's uncomfortable and new, but know that the, that in that journey of going from point A to point B, you're going to learn a lot about yourself, but there will be a peace that overcomes for us. There is a tremendous amount of peace about the decision. And then what it's also done is it's opened my eyes to think, I can do things bigger and in a different capacity as, as the timeline rolls on. So there's more opportunity down the road too. So I, I think that's it. I could probably talk a lot. I love encouraging people. So that's probably my next favorite thing to do, but I, I'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, yeah. Exciting. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. I appreciate the, uh, the time, the conversation. Absolutely. And if people want to follow you on social media, where do they go? So it's at Gan Weather on all my social media platforms. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and threads. So it's G-A-N-N-W-E-A-T-H-E-R. And um, on Facebook, I guess you just look up meteorologist Ashley Gan. And I will say, I'm still going to be very involved on social media. And one really cool thing, I am really going to be leveraging social media in a new and different way coming up. And so I want everyone who's listening to, uh, to, to stop by. I'm going to be adding value in, in the form of some leadership content. So I'm going to be adding that into some of my content. I'll still continue doing weather. My geography will shift a little bit more to East Alabama as I move to Auburn, but I'm still going to be giving weather content. But again, we're going to be adding in two new topics, one on leadership and one on parenting and how to balance working and being a parent and how you do that and, and try to do it well. And Hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be expanding that potentially, not necessarily into a full-blown podcast, but maybe just some interviews on, um, on social media in time. So yes, so stop by. We'd love to connect with you on social media. Wonderful. Well, as somebody that already follows you, I am in utter admiration. I love your personality um, on social media, and you are so entertaining. I mean, you take something like weather and... <laughs> Just make it so fun. So I'm excited. That's the goal. And that's what life should be, right? Taking the mundane and making it magnificent. I love it. I love it. Well, let's go make some fun one of these days um, off air. And uh, I can't wait to, um, to see where you go from here, Ashley. Thanks, April. This was fun. And we'll keep in touch. Seriously. I'll, um, I'll look at my calendar for March too. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. We'll see ya. Bye-bye.